feel like we've gone kind of full circle today. We started out learning about how to get certified organic. We've, we, we, we heard a little bit about that from Tony Silvernail and, and KDA. And then we heard about all the resources where you can you know, get technical assistance or maybe funding to become certified organic. Uh, and then we had Birch come up and talk about, hey, well, may maybe there are options to where you could sell some of your produce if you do get certified. How many people in here are interested in becoming certified organic? All right, so we got at least a couple. Uh, and I know there are some that are already certified in the room. Um, so what I do here at Kentucky State, um, I coordinate the Organic Ag Research and Extension Program. So, uh, and, I, and I teach classes as well. I'm teaching research and extension faculty. Uh, I'm the state organic specialist. Uh, I do research to kind of give myself information to inform my extension. Um, I want to be able to take what I do here at the research farm and translate that into information that I can take out and, and, and help producers that have questions. And so um, we're going to learn a little bit about what we do within my program here. Uh, and, and maybe talk about some ways I might be able to help uh, folks that are interested in getting an organic. And I'm not just limited to organic, I'm a soil health specialist, uh, sustainability specialist, so I can help in a lot of different areas. Um, but I, my, the work that we do here as Extension, it's a public service, it doesn't cost you anything. So you can call Extension and have help come out to your farm, that's my job. And as I said earlier, please get me out from behind my desk. I'll be glad to come visit. Um, I'm, going to I'm going to come talk a little bit about what we do here. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of things over the last, I've been here seven and a half years, so this covers a little bit of everything that we've been doing over the last seven and a half years and some stuff that uh, is new that we're working on uh, going forward this year. This cool picture, this is here at the research farm. We, we have an integrated crop livestock experiment where we're trying to look at how animals and crops can be grown uh, in a sort of a like a crop rotation, but you're actually working the animals into the crop rotation to uh, provide some additional benefits to your soil health. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But these are some of the goats that I get to work with. I just get to borrow them. I don't have to fully manage them. I just talk to McKinley up here and he sends goats down and uh, I get to play with them for a couple weeks or Linnell and the crew get to play with them more so. Um, I have a great team. I have an awesome team and I'm privileged uh, to work with the folks that I work with. Um, so I've introduced myself, and I've introduced Linnell and uh, Shun and uh, Michael Adniji. I don't think I introduced him earlier, but he's an interim research and extension associate with me. I introduced Harper earlier. Uh, Cindy Rice is here. I saw her running around. She works with me on some climate change-related issues. And I got five graduate students. Some are closer than others to getting graduated, but Prashant Bhatt, he's probably, is he here? I, I, yeah, there he is, back in the back. He's, his clock is ticking. He should be graduating probably this year sometime. And Allison Whitted is working with me on a project helping uh, minority farmers get access to information about organic agriculture. Um, and then I have three new students, uh, Benaya Baral, Asmita Bandari, and Mona Joshi. And they're all just got off the plane in what, December, January? And they're all starting working with me on some soil health issues and water quality issues in organic agriculture. So uh, excited to work with the crew that I work with, and I'm lucky to work with them. You heard about certified organic this morning. You know, we're doing research in organic here. We play by the same rules as all the producers that I would be working with. Uh, in fact, last week, uh, was it Thursday? Thursday, we got inspected last week. So Kentucky Department of Agriculture was here saying, hey, we need to see your records. Show us your records. And uh, Linnell and I scrambled, but we got them all the records, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we go through the same process, the same uh, audits. We don't actually sell anything. We're researching for data, right? We harvest the data so that we can provide good information. But we have... Um, Actually closer, this says 14 acres. Uh, we actually have closer to about 16 acres if you count all the land here at the farm that's certified. And then we have some high tunnels over on, uh, uh, on main campus that are certified organic. Um, you know, it's February. I wish we could go out and do more outside, but it's February and you never know what's gonna happen uh, in Kentucky. So we didn't really plan any outdoor workshops today. Uh, but, you know, 
if you look, you go out in the back patio and you look down the hill, you can see some of these areas where we have um, certified organic production. There's also an area here by the front gate. Same rules that the producers follow right down to the inspection and record keeping. We focus on maintaining the soil resource and in maintaining our ecological resources. Um, so we want to be able to help people produce food, fiber, and fuel and do it in a way where we're not degrading that environmental resource, the soil especially, but we also don't want our water quality be, to be degraded. You know, and we do all this in the context of organic systems, but I think a lot of what we do is applicable beyond organic systems. Uh, so I mentioned we're looking at organic uh, integrated crop livestock systems where we're working animals into sort of a crop rotation scheme to help offset some of the damage we might do to the soil. When we're growing crops, we do a lot of tillage. It can degrade some of our organic matter. We're hoping animals on pasture will put some of that organic matter back in the system. We're about to start working on uh, organic no-till systems. Uh, Mona Joshi is around here somewhere. She's a graduate student, and she's going to uh, lead up a project with me uh, looking at how to best start managing no-till systems in Kentucky. You know, if you're looking at non-organic systems, they rely on herbicides. And herbicides work the same way in California as they do in Kentucky, as they do in Maine, as they do in France, you know. But Kentucky's ecosystem is a lot different than California or Maine or France. And so, since we can't use herbicides, we've got to figure out what ecological practices work best to, uh, to, to make a no-till system work in organic in Kentucky. We focus a lot on best management practices. How do we build soil health? How do we build soil carbon? You know, I was just telling Mr. Coleman that the National Organic Program requires if you're a farmer, you got to keep records, you got to monitor all this stuff, you have to build, maintain or build your soil organic matter because that's really the heart of all the nutrient cycling. You feed the crop, you feed the soil to feed your crop. And so they require within the National Organic Program Code, you've got to build or maintain, maintain or build this resource and you've got to be able to show you did it. So Jim probably gonna soil test a little more here in the future. Um, we look at nutrient management in organic systems. Let's talk a little bit more about some of this stuff. Oh, well, I, I also work in industrial hemp, right? So we've been doing that. I've been here since 2016, working with hemp since 2015. Eh, we've kind of tapered off with, with some of the work that we're doing in hemp because the market's tapering off. You know, we've, we had a big CBD kind of boom and bust cycle. Uh, people are still interested in fiber and grain, and there are some people still doing all right with CBD. So uh, we are still sort of keeping our fingers in that as far as research and extension. Um, you know, we're looking at impacts of soil health uh, from hemp, uh, helping people figure out compliance. You know, the, the rule with hemp um, is that it's got to be 0.3% THC or less, and above that it's considered marijuana. So we're, you know, trying to help people figure out varieties that are good for, for compliance uh, over the years. And we've kind of tapered off a lot of that and, and gotten back into uh, the bread and butter of what we do, which is soil health and organic ag, but we're still working a little bit with industrial hemp. Um, my program, as a, as a soil scientist that spent the majority of my career studying soil carbon, uh, it's kind of cool to think about how, you know, 20 years ago I was studying soil carbon and now everybody's talking about carbon, right, because of the climate change issue. Uh, and now we've got, uh, you know, multi-million dollar grants that have been uh, funded by USDA and NRCS, uh, who was here earlier, is funding some of these climate smart agriculture programs. And we're actually, you know, trying to incentivize producers to use management practices that put carbon back in the soil to build and maintain, maintain or build that soil organic matter resource. If you're putting the carbon in the soil, you're facilitating soil health, you're enhancing nutrient, natural nutrient cycling to your crops, and you're also helping to keep the carbon out of the atmosphere. So it's a, you know, it's a win-win situation. 
Uh, so I'm involved with a couple of these climate smart projects, one with Accelerating Appalachia and one with Organic Association of Kentucky. Um, and I'm also uh, the principal investigator here at Kentucky State uh, that leads our group that's part of an 1890 multi-state climate change initiative, 1890 Land Grant University. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. 1890 Land Grant. So we are a historically black college. I'm proud to be here at Kentucky State uh, at an HBCU. Uh, and, you know, part of my job is to serve minority and underserved producers. And uh, we realized a couple years ago that within the organic sector, there was not much human diversity. Um, to the point where three years ago, we had zero black owned certified organic operations. Jim Coleman was the first one in the last couple of years that got his farm certified and we haven't fixed that problem, but we've started, we've started to make inroads on it. Um, and Keith McKenzie is in the room. Uh, he's also certified organic now. And we, I think we have a few more uh, black owned certified organic farms since you guys have gotten certified. So um, one of the things we're doing, I have a, a young woman working with me, Allison Witted. She is conducting a survey to identify barriers, keeping minority and underserved producers out of organic production. Are they informational barriers? Is it a cost barrier? Do they need help with record keeping? How can we help? And so KSU is really trying to assist that and then assist with transitioning into organic, uh, particularly among our underserved minority uh, stakeholders. I mentioned the integrated crop livestock project we're working on. Uh, we're managing crops and, and, and animals in the same rotation. The crops can benefit the animals. The animals can benefit the crops. We do a lot of tillage because we're organic. And for the most part, it's thought that tillage is really what we have to do to control weeds. Now, we're trying to figure out organic no-till. But at the same time, a lot of people are still tilling. Uh, and when you till, you degrade soil organic matter. Can we use animals to to put that organic matter back in the soil. Well, if you're growing animals, you need a pasture. Pasture keeps the soil from being degraded or disturbed. Uh, that disturbance is what causes the loss of organic matter. So by putting it in the pasture itself, you know, we're cutting back on some of that degradation, but then we've got animals on there chewing on the grasses, pooping and peeing, putting organic matter back into the system, right? That's the hope. We also don't want those animals to be putting nutrients in the system that should be staying on the farm. So we're monitoring nutrients coming out of our system. So talk a little bit about this. Here's some goats, right? Goats on the farm in the back, we've got um, organic corn. So basically our crop rotation is this. We have certified organic corn, certified organic soybean, and then three years of goats on pasture. So year one is corn, then year two is soybean, and then year two, three, four, and five are goats on pasture. Uh, and we've been tracking soil health, and we've been tracking uh, nutrient nutrients in the groundwater below these plots to see if, you know, having animals on the plots, does that contribute to nutrient pollution? Because if you have too much nutrients coming out of a plot, where does it end up? Kentucky River, which ends up in the Ohio River, which ends up in the Mississippi River, which causes nutrient pollution problems and, 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 uh, and lack of oxygen uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, which hurts the seafood producers down there. Some more goats in the field. These guys are grazing pasture that had been corn the year before, or soybean the year before. This is what it looks like after a goat is done grazing. Uh, the plot on the left is uh, after the goat is done grazing, the plot on the right has not been grazed. And you can see it's right there next to our, our patch of corn. There's what the goats leave behind, right? Little, little nuggets of nutrients. Uh, helping, our, helping our ecosystem provide natural nutrient cycling. Uh-oh, so we all had lunch, um, and we've got the after lunch sleepies, and now I'm going to throw data at you. Um, what this slide basically shows you is that uh, over time, you know, we have, and let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Oh, yes. Wait, does it work up there? No, yeah, okay. So this one is, uh, this bar represents a plot that is just, constantly corn and soybean. And this bar on the other end is a plot that's just always in pasture. So you've got maximum disturbance over here on the left, 
and minimum disturbance over here on the right. And then the five bars in between represent corn, soybean, year one of goats on pasture, year two of goats on pasture, year three of goats on pasture. And what we're measuring here is uh, it's, a, it's a measurement uh, that represents organic matter. Uh, and so you can see over time, yes, we are disturbing that soil when we're growing corn, and we are you know, getting organic matter levels down near uh, where they are in a plot where we till every year. Uh, but over time, as those goats are existing on that pasture, they're putting organic matter back in the soil. In the interest of time, I'm going to skim over this. This is aggregate stability. If you were paying attention when Tammy was talking earlier, she showed you that slake test and the, the different aggregates in the beakers of water and how they fell apart. This is kind of that same kind of measurement. It's a little more high tech in the lab. But basically what we're seeing here is the same thing we saw on the last slide where, you know, where we're doing a lot of tillage. It's degrading that soil structure. The less tillage we do, we're improving that soil structure and the goats on pasture are sort of facilitating that process. I spoke a little bit about the no-till we're looking at. Uh, I don't want to, to go too deeply on this slide because I kind of already hinted at it, but we really want to figure out what works here in Kentucky and in the southeast. This is no-till hemp that we just were playing around with last year, and so this is kind of the benefits of organic no-till. Uh, the guy in the picture is my buddy Chad Rosen, and he's been working in hemp for years. Uh, he owns uh, Victory Hemp Foods, uh, which is a Kentucky-based company, by the way. If you look, this plot on the left, oh, wrong button. The plot on my left, I guess it would be your right in the picture, right? Uh, that was hemp that was grown in a no-till field or in a no-till plot in other words, we didn't do that aggressive tillage, we, and we planted our seeds with a no-till drill. But we used what's called a flail mower there, which chopped our cover crops into little pieces and, and kind of left it on the, on the ground. Um, the plot on the right where Chad is standing uh, was crimper rollered, which uh, if we look in the, in the last picture, that tractor with the red barrel looking thing on the front, that's a crimper roller. Uh, and you get, you know, rye residue that looks like that nice flat carpet of rye in the picture below. That's how we managed the plot where Chad is standing. This was the end of the season. Uh, those plots were planted at the same day. They were harvested the same day. It's the same variety of hemp. But if you look, that plot where Chad is standing, that hemp is so much taller. And I think this is because, you know, we had a pretty dry year at the end of the year last year. Um, and I think that was moisture retention underneath all that mulch that was resulting from that crimper roller effect. So we're going to study that a little bit more. Uh, I mentioned the climate smart projects that we're working on. I'm running out of time. Um, I'm working with Oak and Accelerating Appalachia on these. We are recruiting farmers to participate in these. So if you're a farmer and you're interested in maybe making some money uh, just for managing your fields well, um, the link there will get you into um, Accelerating Appalachia's farmer recruitment information. And uh, Oak is also recruiting farmers. It's a separate project. Both projects are recruiting farmers. Uh, you could potentially be involved in both as long as you don't put the same fields in each project. Um, but there's an offer, there's an option for, you know, farmers to adopt good management practices and be incentivized financially for it. Uh, one other quick thing I wanted to, to, to mention, and then I'll, I'm, I'm out of time. We're working with Oak, International Organic Inspectors Association. One of the issues in organic agriculture, uh, I mentioned the lack of human diversity among farmers, but there's a lack of human diversity among um, inspectors and certification reviewers. So people that do the job that Tony Silvernail does and people that review all those applications. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lack of human diversity. There's not very much minority participation uh, in that. So it's a real career opportunity. We are holding a training here, uh, end of October or beginning of November, to help train inspectors uh, for organic agriculture. There's a lack of inspectors in general, and there's also a lack of minority uh, and underrepresented inspectors. There will be scholarships available for this. Um, it's a limited number of seats. I think we have a maximum of 18 participants. 
Um, but if you know, you're interested in doing some kind of work like organic inspecting, um, the program is geared towards minority and underrepresented inspectors, but we're trying to train people to be inspectors. It's about a $2,500 cost normally for that inspector training. Uh, but like I said, we will have scholarships available for that program. Uh, and that's happening uh, end of October or beginning of November. We haven't exactly pinned down the dates, but if you want more information, you can reach out to me on that. Kenya went through the same training, uh, what, two years ago, right? Pretty intense training, right? Yeah. All right, so I, I'm out of time. I guess I have maybe time for one or two questions, unless Jonathan tells me no. plastic to control the weed and you still organic? Yes, you can certainly use plastic to control weeds and still be organic. The critical thing you have to remember if you're going to do that is that you have to take the plastic out of the field at the end of the season. So you can't just let the plastic lay out there and eventually, you know, crumble up and decompose or, or till it into the ground. It has to be removed. But you can use plastic and organic. The second question you mentioned, that carbon. How do you get carbon back in the, in the ground? It's a great question, and I could talk, someone would have to give me the hook if I like, used, you know, talked about all the things that you can do. But the things like adding manure to your soil, adding compost to your soil, right, Keith? Compost. Uh, cover crops in good crop rotations is just the beginning of it, right? But you have to, you really have to test it and monitor it, right? And so every couple years, you don't have to do it every year, but every two or three years, you should take soil tests and see if your uh, management practices are having the impact that you hope they're having, right? You don't know unless you're testing. Um, so, but yeah, cover crops, compost, manure, and crop rotation. For carbon specifically? Yes. And who does the testing, I mean? So that's a great question. Um, Tammy was here earlier and she was talking about soil testing. You know, there are a couple options in the state of Kentucky. You can send your samples to University of Kentucky Regulatory Services uh, and they have a soil testing lab. They will do the carbon if you ask them to or they'll call it organic matter, which is really carbon. What they do at University of Kentucky is they actually measure the carbon and then to get the organic matter reading, they multiply the carbon amount by 1.72. It's, it's because roughly 58% of, of organic matter is carbon. So they do that math for you, but they'll give you an organic matter reading. They're basing it on a test for carbon. Waters Ag will do that. Most of your standard soil testing services will measure organic matter. And if you understand what organic matter is, then you can figure out what it means in terms of carbon, or you can specifically ask them to report it as carbon. Awesome. Thank you all for your attention. I'm excited to hear the farmer panel. Oh, one more question. Yeah, you mentioned about having goats on yeah. the fields. Yeah. Um, what if there are other quadrupeds? What if it's a horse? I mean, obviously you're not gonna put six or seven horses, but if you put two horses, would you get the same type of benefit? That's an area we probably need research in, particularly here in Kentucky, right? And now horses are different because, you know, you're usually in a big paddock and and, you know, horse farms are a little different than crop farms. Um, but, I mean, you know, the, uh, the idea there is if they're managed well and you're not keeping them in the same area all the time and allowing them to overgraze and you're taking advantage of the fact that, well, they eat grass and poop and pee, right? Yeah, I would think that, you know, a horse is going to help and plus you're not disturbing that soil. Um, but that's an area where I, I, you know, I don't know that there's been a lot of research on that. So, yeah. I would think the same, you know, the same principles to good herd management or animal management would apply though, right? All right, now I'm really excited for the farmer panel. Thank you all.